A man tossed a piece of breadcrumb out the window, successfully luring a mouse to come for a snack. All was calm around, without a stir in sight. Michael then wrapped another piece in foil and threw it to the same spot to test if the reflection could alert the guards. However, the next thing they knew, the patrol car's headlights suddenly lit up outside the wire mesh. The spotlight from the watchtower shifted towards the mouse, and with a single shot, it was reduced to mush. Michael was terrified. It seemed nearly impossible to escape at night. The next day, Michael sought out McGrady in prison to help him buy two watches and a pair of binoculars, but McGrady only took half the money, as the binoculars, which only the stubborn Guillermo owned, were something he would never sell. Michael found out where Guillermo's cell was. Although he doesn't want to steal someone's beloved treasure, he decides to steal the telescope for the sake of their great escape plan. Michael drew a map on the ground and informed James that the escape would begin the following afternoon. James laughed, having never heard of a daytime escape before. Michael explained that it was a necessary risk, as patrol cars guarded the area all night, and daytime security was relatively lax. The reason for choosing the next afternoon was because of a World Cup final at 2 p.m., when most inmates would be gathered in the yard watching the game. They could take this opportunity to climb out from the window in their room. The only obstacle now was the snipers on the two watchtowers. They had to find their weaknesses in order to make an effective escape. Michael split the binoculars in half, each observing a watchtower, while Mahone was in charge of keeping watch at the door. After hours of observation, James noticed that at 3.13 p.m. M., the sunlight directly hit the west watchtower causing the sniper there to habitually shift his gaze outside the prison. James threw a ball to test his theory and found that the western sniper did not notice the situation inside the wire mesh. And this lasted for about six minutes. The captain of the Northern Watchtower, Ortado, was a true sports fan and would not miss any World Cup matches. Michael noticed that whenever there was a poor signal, Ortado would fuss with the antenna, also momentarily ignoring their side. This meant that if they could overlap the times the guards were distracted, they could slip through the corroded wire mesh hole and escape from prison. But how could they precisely control the actions of both men? Michael thought of a way. He stole a microwave and modified it into an electromagnetic pulse emitter to disrupt electronic signals. James had to admire the company's knack for picking people. Michael was indeed a unique escape genius. Michael plugged in the emitter, and as expected, Hortado started frantically messing with the antenna. But just then, someone passed by the cell door. Michael was momentarily distracted and the sunlight reflected off the binoculars accidentally shown on the watchtower. By the time Michael looked again, Hortado had already aimed his gun at him. Get out! Why? They're coming in! The prison immediately sounded the most severe alarm, and all inmates scrambled to the yard, knowing they would be shot on sight if they didn't appear there in time. Michael and the other inmates kneeled neatly on the ground, followed by a squad of fully armed guards storming in. Rifle scope was seen from the tower. Capitan Hurtado saw it with his own eyes. It's impossible! There is a gun in your prison, and it was pointing at one of my men. We are going to find it. It turned out the guards mistook it for the glare of a sniper scope. After a thorough search, they found the binoculars in Michael's cell. Holding a gun to Michael's head, Hurtado demanded to know why he was being watched, leaving Michael too scared to speak. At the critical moment when Hurtado was about to shoot, James stepped forward. Why were you watching him? I, I wasn't. I was, uh, I was watching birds. He pulled out the bird book his girlfriend had given him from his pocket. Upon seeing the bird illustrations, Captain Escamilla thought he was just a bird enthusiast and decided not to pursue the matter further. Go back. Hurtado. Yeah, déjalo. Having narrowly escaped trouble, Michael rushed back to his cell, only to find the door firmly locked by the guards. Michael felt utterly devastated. Not only was the cell their escape route, but the microwave-turned-electromagnetic pulse emitter was also inside. Declaring their meticulously planned escape plan aborted once again, the guards slowly opened the prison's main gate, and as they brought in new prisoners, they failed to notice an old paper cup also being blown into the prison by the wind. It was this very discarded paper cup that would bring a new dawn to the trio planning to escape. After observing, Michael discovered that Hurtado always drinks coffee of this brand at noon every day. This meant that if they could find out where he buys his coffee, they could seize the opportunity to drug him into unconsciousness, then slip away through the corroded hole in the wire mesh and escape from the prison. The next morning, Michael handed the discarded paper cup to Lincoln, who came for a visit, asking him to check around for the location of this coffee and drug it before 3 p.m. After all, 
Their escape was scheduled for precisely 3.13 p.m. that afternoon. Then, Michael inquired about his girlfriend Sarah and L. J. Wondering why he hadn't received any photos of them lately, Lincoln avoided eye contact and deliberately changed the subject. But Michael sensed something was off and made a stern statement, if he doesn't see a live photo of them an hour before the escape, he wouldn't go through with it. Lincoln was in turmoil because Sarah had been killed by people from the company. If he told the truth, Michael would definitely not escape. And then his son would surely be killed. But after coming out, Lincoln still asked Sophia to inquire about the brand of coffee. Sophia. A native Panamanian, recognized at a glance that it was from a shop a few kilometers away, where the guards must have bought their coffee. Without wasting a moment, Lincoln rushed to find Susan B. He asked her to urgently prepare a photo of Sarah alive and to procure a drug that would take effect an hour after being ingested. At noon, Lincoln and his group were already staking out the coffee stand and indeed saw Hurtado, who regularly came to buy coffee. Lincoln prepared the drugged coffee and pretended to accidentally knock the coffee out of Hurtado's hands. Here, look, uh, this is a, a buddy's. Please, please, I insist. Just as Hurtado reached out to catch it, the shop owner unexpectedly offered him another cup for free. Lincoln felt utterly despondent, seeing the plan nearly fall apart. Sophia quickly unbuttoned a few buttons on her blouse. Excuse me, senor, I just need to go to Sona. I, I, my car's run out of gas. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm heading in the wrong, the wrong direction. I'm, I'm I not. really need to go to Sona. Hey, mi amor. Yo te llevo. Venga. Taking the drugged coffee, Sophia followed him, and as expected, halfway there, Hurtado's lustful nature took over, he leeringly said, you must have a relative in prison, if you're with me, I'll arrange for you two to meet every day. In a moment of quick thinking, Sophia claimed, you guessed right, my relative is actually Lechero. Upon hearing Lechero's name, Hurtado's face drastically changed, as he was just a regular guard who dared not mess with Lechero's woman, while Hurtado was distracted. Sophia quietly switched the coffees, with only an hour left until the escape. Lincoln immediately sought Susan B for the photo, but upon opening it, Lincoln was shocked to find the photo was exactly the same as the last one, still cut out from a newspaper. Do you think my brother is an idiot? Here's the pictures. He's gonna want to see this close up. I'm done doing favors for you. Get out. I'll see you in an hour. Lincoln was utterly speechless, with no other choice. He had to reveal to Michael the truth about Sarah's death. She's dead, Michael. I lied to you. I'm sorry. If you don't break out today, they're gonna kill my son. This news hit Michael like a thunderbolt, and he walked away without looking back. In order to rescue his beloved Sarah, he risked beheading to escape from prison. Now that Sarah is dead, what's the point of escaping? Not only that, but his brother had lied to him for so long. Michael went to the yard and without saying a word, threw a chicken foot at James. Since the company was so ruthless, then he would kill James first. Under the certification of Lechero in the prison, both men returned to their cells to prepare their wills. And 15 minutes later, they were scheduled to duel to the death on the playground on time. In the corridor, James was in a daze. He couldn't understand why Michael, who had been trying to get him out of prison, wanted to fight him. However, at that moment, a hand landed on James's shoulder. Look, I don't know what you're thinking, but killing me is not going to solve your problems. I'm not going to kill you. Then what the hell was all that about? You want to make it out of here without being seen? You need a diversion. Now we have one. It turned out this was also part of Michael's escape plan. Although Sarah was dead, he still needed to save his nephew, LJ. He deliberately provoked the duel to attract all the prisoners to the playground, so they could take this opportunity to escape from Sammy's cell in the prison. It was now 3 p.m., and there were only 13 minutes left until the sniper on the watchtower would be drugged and unconscious, and only 15 minutes until the duel, meaning they had just two minutes to escape from the prison. Without delay, the two needed to prepare for the escape within 13 minutes. Michael, having stolen a tattoo machine, rushed to Sammy's room. James took out the rope ladder they had made from hammocks. The playground was abuzz with noise. All the inmates gathered in anticipation of the life and death struggle. Michael disassembled the head of the tattoo machine and placed it at the point where the wire mesh met the wall, using the noise as cover to hammer vigorously at the iron window. After breaking open the window, Michael tied one end of the rope ladder to an iron post. At 3.12 p.m., M. Hurtado on one of the watchtowers drank the coffee laced with a sleeping drug and soon passed out, slumping over. Now. There was only the other guard on the watchtower left to worry about. Michael and James kept a close watch on their watches, 
waiting for the 3.13 p.m. sun. But unexpectedly, today's sunlight arrived a bit later than usual, and the other guard was slow to move his position, just as they were getting frantic, a blinding reflection of sunlight finally arrived, and the guard finally turned his head away from the prison, allowing the two to remove the security window and prepare to act. But just then, rapid footsteps were heard in the corridor, it turned out Sammy had come back to grab something, causing the two to quickly hide under the bed, barely daring to breathe, Sammy felt the dust on the desk, and though he sensed something was amiss, his eagerness to watch the duel made him overlook it. After Sammy left, the two hurriedly dropped the rope ladder and began their action, to ensure James's safety. Michael went down the rope ladder first, but just as he landed, a large cloud slowly drifted over. Seeing it about to cover the sun, Michael urgently instructed James to climb back up. Our only chance. Fortunately, the guard didn't notice, but this also meant the escape plan had failed. Michael felt a deep despair but knew they had to quickly pull the rope ladder back up. As James was untying the knots, Lechero sensed something was amiss and hurriedly sent his men to search the rooms for them. Hearing their shouts, James could only hastily place the rope ladder on the windowsill, but before they could take a few steps, they were dragged out for the duel. As they passed Lechero, Michael tried to call off the fight claiming it was just a small misunderstanding and they had already made up. But the crowd's mood was already stirred up, and calling off the duel was like a pipe dream. Well, must be Let's go. With no way out, the inmates pushed them to the center of the arena, where they stood looking at each other, not knowing whether to laugh or cry. Seeing that they were hesitant to fight, people started throwing stones at them, and James, in a bid to survive, made the first move against Michael. As they fought, a breeze caused the rope ladder on the windowsill to begin sliding down quietly. The other guard on the watchtower also noticed something was off since he hadn't seen Hurtado for a while, so he quickly sent someone to check. The guard who came up realized Hurtado had been drugged and immediately grabbed the binoculars to look towards the prison, just in time to see the rope ladder blown down by the wind. The guard was shocked, realizing a prisoner was attempting to escape, so he immediately grabbed the walkie-talkie to alert his superiors. Moments later, a large number of armed guards headed towards the prison, and a series of urgent siren sounds erupted, forcing the deadly fight inside the prison to come to an abrupt halt. The fully armed guards pushed open the door, and the prisoners, well-practiced, knelt with their heads in their hands, daring not to make the slightest move. You! Come down here. Now! We are going to find out who is behind this. Colonel Escamilla demanded to know who cell 212 belonged to, but in prison, snitching on a fellow inmate is a despicable act condemned by all. The scene fell into a deathly silence, and seeing no one speak up, Escamilla decided to make an example of someone. You are one of the Lokman's boys, eh? Is it yourself? Papo glanced at Sammy, although he wanted to say it was Sammy's room. Sammy was the second in command in the prison. Snitching would eventually lead to his own demise. As Papo hesitated, Escamilla did not give him a chance to speak. Everyone was terrified, but Escamilla did not intend to dig deeper. Instead, he turned his attention to Lechero. I allowed you to conduct your business here to bring in your prostitutes, in exchange for simply keeping these inmates in line for me. You can't even manage that small task efficiently. In a moment of anger, Escamilla even revealed a shocking secret to everyone present. It turns out the reason Sona Prison was lacking water and food was all Lechero's doing. Lechero and Escamilla had made a private agreement to block Sona Prison's water pipes and control the timing of food deliveries by Lechero to consolidate his ruling position here. But now, Escamilla had lost trust in Lechero. Maybe we just backed the wrong horse, hmm? Perhaps there is another in here. Better suited for the job? Good luck. Breda. Escamilla finished and took all the guards away, 
leaving only the disgraced Lechero behind. Lechero, stripped of his dignity, faced the scorn of inmates who began spitting at him. From this moment on, Lechero's ruling position in the prison began to crumble, and the one responsible for all this is the man who tried to escape from the prison. Lechero knew well that if someone was planning an escape, there was only one person most likely to do so Michael, who had been acting suspiciously every day. Sammy, furious, grabbed Michael and brought him before Lechero. Just as Sammy was debating whether to fry or stew him, to everyone's surprise, Lechero snatched the knife from Sammy's hand and pushed Michael into a secret room. Are you trying to break out of this prison, Mrs. Schofield? No. Are you trying to break out of this prison? We both know that's not possible. Answer me or else! What do you want me to say? I want you to tell me the truth! I want to hear it! You want a reason to kill me? No one! The next second, Lechero actually cut the ropes binding Michael's hands. Lechero was clear in his mind that he had already committed a serious crime and staying here would mean certain death. He might as well join Michael in his escape attempt. You are breaking out of this prison, Mr. Schofield. And you're taking me with you. Meanwhile, General Krantz, the boss of the company, also learned about the failure of the prison break, and he had no patience to wait any longer, so he directly instructed Susan B. to rob the prison violently. Susan B. came for a prison visit and informed James of the company's plan to violently storm the prison, also instructing him to find an opportunity to eliminate Michael, while Lincoln outside would be dealt with by them, but what they didn't know was that their meeting was clearly observed by Michael. 